Hey, I'm Zach. Thanks so much for checking out this week's message. I hope that it encourages you. I hope it challenges you. And I hope that it causes you to dive deeper into God's word. I also hope that you have some community around you that you can talk through some of these things with. And if you don't, we'd love to invite you to be a part of our community here at Restore, whether that's coming to one of our Sunday gatherings or coming to one of our Restore groups. Either way, we would love to see you. You can get more information about that on our website at restoreaustin.org. And I hope you enjoyed this week's video. About five years ago, um, I went to my first AA meeting. The room was stuffy and it smelled like this kind of mixture of, of old cigarettes and burnt coffee. Some people were talking really loudly. Other people were kind of sitting by themselves alone, quietly. I walked into the room with one of my best friends who greeted people with hugs and handshakes. And he's always a guy that's been able to light up any room that he walked into. And that night was no different. You know, actually that night he was probably even more charismatic because that night he was receiving a sobriety chip. As we walked toward our seats, I was struck by how different everyone was. My friend gave high fives to people that looked like they were still in high school and then bent over to hug elderly folks who couldn't even get up out of their chairs. He was greeted by people of every race, every sexual orientation, every socioeconomic background and every lifestyle. None of the things that usually divide people mattered that night. They were all uni united and unified by the only requirement to be a part of AA, and that is a desire to stop drinking. They were a family. And because they were a family, they were overjoyed that night to watch one of their brothers celebrate a milestone in his sobriety. And over the next hour, I saw the most beautiful things happen. People poured out their hearts as they shared. People encouraged each other. People loved each other. And at the center of it all was something you would have never expected to see or feel at an AA meeting. And that was joy. Just pure joy. And, and the joy was easy to miss at first. You see, this wasn't, this wasn't a happy room. You know, it wasn't like people were laughing at jokes or singing along to a fun song. They weren't clapping like somebody just blown out birthday candles at a birthday party. They, in fact, many of them were downcast. You know, many of them were sitting in their seats and sharing their struggles, and some were even crying. There was one young guy that shared that I remember vividly. His name was Jeremy. His head was down, and you could barely hear him as he began to share kind of the same way that everyone does, right? He says, my name is Jeremy, and I'm alcoholic. And he proceeded to talk about all the ways that alcohol had ruined his life, how he was only 48 hours sober, but he hoped more than anything to spend the rest of his life sober. After he finished, people said things like, hey, we're, we're glad you're here, Jeremy. You're taking the first step, man. Some, some older guy said, I'm so proud of you, son. You can do this, Jeremy. And the whole time as he shared, his head was downcast. He was looking at the floor. And like I said, he was just barely audible. But after the encouragement from the family around him, his head comes up. And the, the faintest smile sweeps across his face. And I saw it. 
joy, even if it was just for a second. He had joy in the midst of some of the worst suffering that he'd ever been through. That picture of Jeremy's face smiling in the midst of deep pain came flooding back to me this week as I was thinking about this message. As I said earlier, last week we began this series called Rejoice in Our Suffering. And the series is based on Romans 5, chapter, or Romans chapter 5, verse 3, which says, We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Last week, we took a really deep dive into this phrase, rejoice in suffering. We looked at the original language. We looked at the context, what it meant in the first century. And we kind of made the best modernized translation that we could. And here it is. I choose to hold my head up high, even when everything is closing in around me. I choose to hold my head up high, even when everything else is closing in around me. As Jeremy sat in that dark, dingy room that night, everything was closing in around him. His whole life, his whole world had been wrecked by alcohol. And yet, just for a moment, he lifted his head up high. He found a little piece of joy in the midst of suffering. But the most tragic thing happened at the end of that meeting. My friend had gotten his chip So everybody was celebrating with him, the meeting ends, and and we're standing there, and, you know, he's showing his chip to everyone, and everybody's giving him slaps on the back and high fives and hugs, and we're talking with everyone, and I look over, and I see Jeremy walking out the door. But the smile was gone. The head was back down. And he walked back into that world filled with suffering the same way he'd walked in that night. So my question for us this morning is how do we find real and lasting joy in the midst of suffering? Not just lifting our heads up for a moment, not just finding some happiness every now and then, but finding the strength to hold our heads up high, even when everything is closing in around us. Today we're looking at finding joy in the midst of addiction and mental health struggles. And we put these two things together for a few reasons. Number one, they both represent ongoing battles. Even though some people are delivered immediately from them, we've heard stories like that. The vast majority of people who suffer from addiction and mental health issues deal with them for the rest of their lives. The second reason we put these together is because these issues are actually more prevalent than most people realize. I think those who don't deal with them have a tendency to assume that not very many other people deal with them. And then those who do struggle with them assume that they're alone, assume that they're in the minority, and they kind of keep it to themselves. But in fact, over 43% of Americans deal with anxiety, depression, or both on a daily basis. Over 21% of kids aged 13 to 18 live with a mental health condition. Each year, one in five females and one in seven males engage in self-harm, including 20% of kids between 13 and 18. At an average college with 18,000 undergraduate students, about 1,100 of them will consider suicide any given year. Over 21 and a half million Americans are currently battling a substance abuse disorder, but only about 5% of them receive treatment for it. Over 50% of adults who experience substance abuse disorders have a co-occurring mental struggle, mental illness struggle. More than 30 million Americans have an eating disorder. Almost 75% of people with eating disorders have a co-occurring disorder like depression or anxiety. And finally, pornography is a $13 billion a year business in the U.S. alone. And studies show that it affects up to 90% of men and 65% of women. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has a national hotline for people facing mental and or substance use disorders. That hotline receives more than 65,000 calls a month. This is a real and prevalent issue in our world, in our society, and in our church. 
Lastly, we're talking about these issues together because both of them are often stigmatized. Since they aren't traditional health issues like cancer or the flu, they're often met with comments like, can't you just make better decisions? Can't you just figure it out? If you really wanted to get past this, you would. And unfortunately, this misunderstanding of addiction and mental health is found frequently inside of religious communities. And because of that, I want to take a minute and I want to address some dangerous and really simply unbiblical theology that is much too popular in church circles today. The basic theology is this. If your faith is strong enough, you will experience complete healing for any and all issues. If your faith is strong enough, you just believe hard enough, if you pray enough, you'll experience healing from any and all issues. We've probably all heard about fundamentalist groups that only practice these faith healings for sick followers, how they forbid members from visiting doctors, right? These groups are often in the news after people die from common colds or the flu because they weren't allowed to seek medical help. But when we see that, we often write those things off, right? Those people are crazy. That's a cult. That that, that theology doesn't really exist in, in mainstream church culture. But there is a much more pervasive and mainstream form of this terrible, dangerous theology coming from some of the most influential faith leaders in America. It's subtle, right? They would never say that you you shouldn't take your sick child to the doctor. They would never say you shouldn't get a cast for a broken bone. Instead, this form of theology applies faith healings to mental health and addiction. I'm going to read a few quotes to you from prominent faith leaders that were made in the last handful of years. I'm not going to use their names. If you ask me who they are later, I'm not going to tell you because that's not the point. The point is that this exists in mainstream church culture today, and it's so vitally important that we point it out and that when we see it and hear it, that we recognize it for what it is, and that's dangerous and unbiblical. While talking to a large group of U.S. soldiers, one pastor quoted a Bible verse from Numbers 32 about Israel's soldiers being free from guilt and then says, quote, any of you suffering from PTSD right now, you listen to me. You get rid of that right now. You don't take drugs to get rid of it. It doesn't take psychology. That promise from Numbers 32 right there will get rid of it. One pastor describes depression this way, quote, depression really comes from being discontent with who you are or what's going on. It's not accepting yourself or not accepting the situation. I'm always drawn back to one of the very first things God told mankind back in Genesis. In Genesis 4, you have Cain and Abel. They're both still alive. And Cain is really kind of upset over the direction things are heading. God went to him and said, look, you're really depressed. Your face is downcast and you're really sad. Cain, you need to understand something. And in Genesis 4, 6, and 7, the Lord said to Cain, Why is your face downcast? Why this depression? He said, If you do what's right, you'll be accepted. But if you don't do what's right, sin is crouching at your door, and you have to rule over it. So much of this depression stuff is fixed just by doing the right thing. Another pastor gives his cure to mental health problems simply by saying, quote, we will find mental health when we stop staring in the mirror and fix our eyes on the strength and beauty of God. I'm really not sure of another way to say it. The theology espoused by these religious leaders is unbiblical and it's dangerous. It hurts people. In Colossians chapter 1, we have a beautiful description of Jesus from the Apostle Paul. He says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He's saying Jesus is God. He is God that you can see right in front of you. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. This is clearly telling us that Jesus is the creator and sustainer of all things. All things. Not only that, all good things in this world are from him. James 1.17 says, Whatever is good and perfect comes down to us from God, who created all the lights in heaven. Hear me. If we truly believe 
what the Bible teaches, that God is the creator and sustainer of everything, that all good and helpful and healing things come from him, then we must believe that he uses prayer and counseling and therapy and medication and so many other things to help people who are hurting. God creates doctors and inspires them to develop medicine. He creates therapists and inspires them to lead therapeutic counseling sessions. God has different treatment plans for all of us, and as we trust and we rely on him, he leads some of us to find help through medication. He leads some of us to find help through therapy and counseling. He leads some of us to find help through the love and support of our church family and our friends and the people around us. And many, and I would say most people, he leads to a combination of those things. No two treatments are the same. We have a personal, beautiful, loving God who deals with his children on an individual basis. This doesn't take away from God's miraculous power. It adds to it. When God was here on earth in the person of Jesus, he miraculously healed people with crippling disease. You don't think that a little vial of medicine that can prevent polio is a miracle from God? Jesus healed people when he was here on earth who had been blind since birth. You don't think that surgery that allows a child born blind to see again is a miracle from God? Yeah, that's a miracle from God. God provides help and healing to his children suffering with addiction and mental health struggles in a variety of ways, including medication, therapy, support groups, and many other things. And anyone who tells you different has an unbiblical understanding of healing and a very small understanding of God's power. All that being said, I want you to know up front this morning that I am not a doctor. I am not a professional counselor. If you or your loved one is dealing with mental health or addiction struggles this morning, it is not my intention to give you a cure, a treatment plan for what you're walking through. It is my hope this morning to help you see how you can find joy in the midst of that suffering, how you can hold your head up high even when everything else is closing in around you. And I think that the most helpful passage of Scripture concerning finding joy in the midst of ongoing suffering is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So you can turn there, you can scroll there with me, or the verses will be on the screen behind me. We're going to start in verse 7. This is Paul talking. He says, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Now, the identity of Paul's thorn is really one of the most hotly debated topics for theologians. Endless suggestions have been made. An illness, persecution, a speech impediment, or even an addiction. But the bottom line is this. We have no idea what it is. And I think actually that makes this passage of Scripture even more full. Because we don't know what the thorn was, but we do know that it provided Paul with ongoing suffering. Verse 8. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. Paul has begged God to take this thorn from Satan out of his side. That's a totally reasonable request, right? We've made requests like that before of God. God, if, you, if you'll just help me get through this. God, God, just take this addiction away. Heal this illness. Take this pain from me. Please, God, if you do it, I'll do anything. Sometimes he does. I've heard miraculous stories of, of heroin addicts coming to faith in Jesus and then never having the desire to touch a needle again. Do I believe God can do that? Absolutely. He is God and he can do whatever he wants. Our God is a God of miracles. But do I believe that God always does that? Absolutely not. Because for every story of a miraculous healing, there are a hundred more of struggle and constant temptation and relapse. 
Do I believe the amount or purity of faith of someone begging God to take their thorn away affects whether or not God grants their request? Absolutely not. Some of the most faith-filled people in history had daily battles with thorns that never go away, including Paul. Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. Most consider him to be the greatest Christian to ever live. You don't think he had a lot of faith? But his thorn didn't get taken away. If that's you, if you're dealing with some thorns this morning and you think somehow somewhere deep inside you've gotten bad information or somebody's told you something that's erroneous and you think that you just don't have enough faith to get that thorn taken away, have courage and hope that that's not it. It's Paul, one of the most faith-filled people in all of history, had a thorn his whole life. And Paul had every right to get angry about his thorn. It would have been easy for him to blame God for not taking it away, or like we said, even blame himself for not having enough faith, but that's not what he does. Instead, he changes his perspective on it. Verse 10, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. Paul delights in his thorn. He rejoices in his suffering. Why? Because when I am weak, then I am strong. When Paul is weak, Paul is strong. If you were here last week, we talked about the parts of the Bible that sometimes don't make sense when we first read them. This is one of those parts, right? How can you be weak and strong at the same time? It's because our weakness is a constant reminder of our need for the strength of Jesus. And there is nothing in this world stronger than someone who is trusting Jesus with every part of their lives. C.S. Lewis put it this way, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. This completely reshapes our point of view. Our pain is a constant reminder to trust Jesus. Our weakness becomes our strength. That's what we're talking about when we talk about rejoicing in suffering. That's what it looks like to hold your head up high, even when everything is closing in around you. For those of you in this room who battle and those of you who support people who battle addiction and mental health issues, I know what you're thinking right now. I know you're thinking this all sounds really good, Zach, but you don't understand what my pain is like. You don't understand what my suffering means. Can I really experience help and healing and joy in the midst of this? I'm here to tell you that the answer is yes. But instead of taking my word for it, I want to tell you my friend Shauna's story. See, Shauna was first abused when she was around three years old. And that abuse continued in different forms and from different people for more than two decades. And even as a young girl, Shauna hated God. She didn't understand how a God who was supposed to be good would continue to keep allowing these horrible things to happen to her. The only thing she hated more than God was the church. You see, one time when she was 12, she was sitting in the church that her grandparents sometimes drug her to. And as the service was starting, a black family walked in. Silence came over the all-white congregation as they watched this family walk up toward some empty seats. When the pastor of the church saw what was happening, he motioned to a deacon who quickly stood up, walked toward the family and let them know in no uncertain terms that they were not welcome there. Seeing this unfold made Shauna realize just how much hate people had for each other and it solidified her belief that she was never supposed to trust anyone. When you experience the trauma that Shauna experienced and you see the things that she saw, you have to find a way to cope. You have to turn somewhere. 
But for Shauna, the safe places that many of us turn simply weren't options. Her family wasn't safe. Her friends weren't safe. And even the church wasn't safe. So Shauna turned to cutting. And for her, it was the only way that she could control the pain. She wasn't trying to end her life. She was just trying to control it because you see, on her own, she couldn't deal with the pain. She couldn't bear the emotions that overwhelmed her so often. And when she cut, she could disassociate. She could be somewhere else. She could leave the trauma and the suffering of her life behind and go somewhere else completely. Two different times she cut so severely that she almost lost her life. In fact, both times the doctors who brought her back said they didn't understand how she'd made it through, that it was a miracle. Cutting became an addiction, something that Shauna couldn't live without. During her worst times, she was cutting six times a week, many times multiple times a day. She stopped cutting each time she was pregnant. She firmly believed that the life inside her mattered more than her own. But then, after each baby came, she would tell herself, that's it, I'm quitting for good. But no matter how hard she tried, she would always go back to it. And she got pregnant with her youngest a little over three years ago. And after he was born, she made that same commitment to never go back to cutting. She said, this time it's going to be different. But one day, she was walking in the park, holding her new baby, feeling completely overwhelmed, like everything was closing in around her. And the urge to cut came on like a tidal wave. The the strength, the magnitude of it was so heavy on her shoulders that she was forced to physically sit down on a park bench. As she sat in her suffering with her head cast down, suddenly she felt someone sit down next to her. She looked up to see who it was, but there wasn't anyone there. But even though she couldn't see anyone, there was this undeniable presence next to her on the bench. And Shauna will tell you that she isn't quite sure how it happened, but it quickly became obvious that the person sitting next to her on that park bench was Jesus. As they sat there, he lifted her head. He looked into her eyes and he said, I'm with you now. You don't have to cut anymore. I'm here and I'll be here with you through everything you encounter. You don't ever have to be alone again. The first time I met Shauna, she told me that story. And after it was over, she said, I'm still not sure about all this religious stuff, but I know, Zach, I know that Jesus loves me. I know that he loves me. Since that day, on the park bench, she has placed her faith in Jesus, and I had the incredible privilege of baptizing her at our BAPTQ last year. I also got to baptize her two older boys last Easter after they met Jesus here at Restore. She and Courtney and their boys have become some of my family's closest friends through our Restore group. A couple of weeks ago during our group, Shauna read us all a poem she had written about the incredible love of Jesus, about how he gives her strength, the strength to hold her head up, the strength to pick up her cross and follow him no matter what comes her way. I'm gonna share that poem with you. In my own hands, my life was a mess. Abuse, self-harm, total distress. Bad choices delivered my destructed soul, falling every time into my black hole. A cycle that left me with guilt and fear. A timeline that expired was always so near. I didn't believe in you, but I cursed your name 
How could this happen? It was you that I blamed. I refused to hear your story, but you were living mine, right by my side through every terrible time. When I doubted and when I deceived, you took your last breath and you released. Releasing me from all my sins, and you still do it again, again and again. When I felt alone, you held on more. When I was lost, you searched every storm. Even when I didn't know it, even when I denied, you sat with me right by my broken side. Jesus, I glorify. It's unjustifiable. It makes no sense to give your grace away, to put it in these hands of mine, the ones that cannot pray. Forgiveness for us sinners, the misfits and the thieves, we were the ones who turned our backs when you couldn't even breathe. And still I ask for mercy in which I cannot see. And without hesitation, you hand it over to me. You hold on to me with more love and more grace, forgiving me for my every mistake, fighting the battles and using them for good, showing me the way through the misunderstood. And when I question and I expect to win, you answer with nothing but grace again, again and again. Every year it comes around, the day that you died, hanging from that cross, being crucified, for me, you bled. I am redeemed. I cannot fathom what that even means. I regretfully forget what it signifies. With every breath in, I must realize if it wasn't for you, my lungs would not fill, my heart would not beat, and my soul would not heal. My life would be nothing but a dark masquerade. I thank you, Jesus, for this life you saved. You died on the cross to give me a choice and rose again so I could hear your voice. Even when I cannot hear it or it doesn't sound the same, I know you're still there calling my name, saying I'm worthy and to not be afraid, to trust in you, Lord, and walk this way. With grace, you chose to lay your life down so that when I'm lost, I will be found. I know that you love me and always care. I know you will forever be right there. With my head lifted and my hands held high, I praise you, Jesus, Lord of my life. You are my savior, you are my friend. I will pick up my cross and follow you again, again and again. Shauna will be the first one to tell you um, that she isn't cured now. She still thinks about cutting every single day. She told me the other day that she wakes up each morning thinking, is this gonna be the day that I start cutting again? But she hasn't cut for years now. And when she looks down at her arms and asks herself that question, each morning she's quick to pick her head up high and exclaim, no, it's not. And then every morning she spends a few minutes with Jesus. Life isn't perfect. Shauna's head still drops down all the time, but that same person who lifted her head up on that park bench is with her, giving her strength to lift it up again, again, and again. The one who sat next to her now lives inside of her through the Holy Spirit. And he still tells her the same thing he told her that day. I'm here, Shauna. You don't ever have to be alone again. For the first time in a long time, Shauna is safe. You can hear it in her voice. You can see it in the way that she carries herself. She holds her head up high, not because she's strong in her own power, but because she's weak. 
And in her weakness, she fully relies on Jesus. And when she does that, I can honestly tell you that she is one of the strongest people that I know. She is filled to the brim with the joy that only comes from Jesus. When I talked to Shauna this week, she said, through Jesus Christ, Zach, I have been blessed. I went from never feeling safe to having a family I feel safe with, friends I feel safe with, and a church home I feel safe with. My friends, I am telling you that joy in suffering is possible. I'm telling you that it's possible. I've seen it in Shauna's life. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in the lives of so many others. You really can hold your head up high. Even when it feels like everything's closing in. Even when you're battling addiction and mental health struggles. But the key isn't more control over your life. It's less The key isn't trying to be strong all the time and pick yourself up by your bootstraps. It's realizing that you're weak and that you need help. Rejoicing in suffering means placing your addiction, your mental health, and every part of your life in the hands of Jesus. Every moment of every day. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you for our time together this morning. I want to thank you for the scripture that we looked at, the scripture that teaches us that when we are weak, we are actually strong. Because when we just try to be strong ourselves and we try to fix everything, when we try to put all the broken pieces back together with our own hands, God, it absolutely never works. But when we realize our weakness and we place every part of our lives in your hands, you, the master potter, the master craftsman, put things back together again, and we're more beautiful than we were before we broke. You are the creator and the sustainer of all things, including each and every one of us. You've called us your children You've called us your sisters and your brothers and your friends. Your love for us knows no bounds, God. So I pray for myself and for anyone else in this room who's walking through suffering. And we would stop trying to fix everything ourselves and we would place it like Shauna, like so many others have, in your hands. In your immensely capable, nail-scarred hands. And watch as you do more than we could ever ask or imagine with our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we sing this song together, I want to invite you into a time of prayer. If you've been holding on to control, trying to battle addiction and mental health struggles in your own power, it's time this morning to let those things go, to hand those things to Jesus. I want to invite you to just pray a really simple prayer and hand them over. If you can't find the words, just pray something like this. Jesus, I'm tired of pretending that I'm strong enough to do this alone. Remind me of my weakness so that I can find hope in your strength. Amen. If you want someone to pray with you, me and Lauren, the head of our prayer team, are just going to be right over there. Right by that sign that says prayer. And we would love to pray with you. More than that, we would love to walk with you. You are not meant to do this alone. So we're here. We love you.